So, we've learnt PowerShell really well. We've got to grips with how to use it effectively and how to take advantage of it. But, you know, we haven't actually done much useful stuff with it. We've learnt how all these commands work, how it's all structured internally, we've done all that. But now it's time to actually get some tasks done. These are tasks that would be a nightmare to try and perform on other command lines, but are pretty much easy in PowerShell once you get used to doing it. However, just before we get into that, I want to talk about variables, because these are an extremely useful tool that we'll be using a lot throughout the series. Now, what a variable is, is essentially a place we can store hold on to objects. Every variable has a unique name and we use that name to identify it. For example, let's imagine this scenario. I want to get all the processes with a CPU time above 20 once and then I want to work on those objects loads of times. So let's say I get all the processes and then I want to let's say get the average and I also want to filter them down even more and I also want to sort them. And I'm gonna look at the results of all three of these things and they're gonna help me do whatever it is I'm trying to do. Now, to do this, what we could do is write out the exact same thing every single time. So, for the first thing, I'm going to get all the processes, filter them down, and then do my thing. For the second thing, I'm going to get all the processes, filter them down, and then do my thing. And same goes for the third thing. And this does work, but there's a few problems. Not only does it take a fair bit of effort to write the exact same thing again and again, but it's also actually slower for the computer to process than it needs to be, because we're getting PowerShell to filter the exact same processes in the exact same way over and over again. We're making it do this thing here three times. What if we could do this bit once? and then remember what objects it gave us, and then keep using those objects again and again. That would be much easier to do, and much more efficient for the computer too, in both CPU and memory usage. Well, we can do that. Introducing variables. Variables let us remember objects to reuse again and again. Let's hop into PowerShell and take a look at this. So, the way we use variables is by writing a dollar sign followed by the unique name we want to give our variable. So, let's use the example I had. I'm getting all the processes, and only the ones that have more than 20 seconds CPU time. Now, what we want to do is remember these objects in a variable. So, to do that, what we first need to do is choose a variable name. Let's call it dollars expensive processes. It doesn't matter what we call it. This name is just for us, so we can use the variable later on. Just as long as the name isn't the same as any other variable, we won't have any problems with it. Alright, and then, to put these objects into the variable, what we do is we use equals. So we say that expensive processes equals whatever this gives us. And you'll notice that we got nothing. Does that mean it failed? Well, actually no. What's happened is all of these objects have actually now gone into the variable. And because they're in the variable, and it's all good now, PowerShell isn't showing us the objects. Because it's decided it doesn't need to. The objects are where we want them. So, that's how you change variables. And you can change variables as much as you want. Now, how do we use them? How do we get what's in our variable and use it? Well, it's actually very simple. We just write out the name of the variable. That's it. So, if I simply write my variable name out and do nothing else with it, it will get all of the objects inside it. And since we're not doing anything with those objects, PowerShell will write it all out for us. Now, in our scenario, one of the things we wanted to do is take what's in the variable and filter it down to just CPU time and work out the average. So, what we're going to do is take what's in our variable and pipe that data, pipe what's into it, over into for each, and then work out the average from that. And that's how variables work. That's it. This also explains a missing piece of information we had right back in episode 1. When you use for each, what does the dollars underscore mean? Well, quite simply, 
this dollars underscore is just a special variable that gets swapped out automatically by for each, depending on which item we're on. That's all it is. It's just a variable that gets changed by for each for each object one by one. And then inside for each, we follow this swapped out variable by a dot. And if you remember back to episode one, this dot means we're going to reach into one of the things inside the object. So let's just say that hypothetically, I have one object in this variable called person containing three properties, a name, a birthday, and an organization. Now, if we wanted to get this person's name just on its own, what we can do is write person and then do dot name. So we're taking our person in this variable and grabbing just the name out of them. And there you go, it's Alex. Then setting, changing, it is really easy. What we do is add an equal sign and we say whatever we want to put in it. Let's put Mike in there. So this literally says, make my person object's name equal Mike. It's just like how we do variable equals the result from some command. It's the exact same thing. So we do that, and now if we look at it again, oh look, the name is Mike, and we can change it however we want. All right, great. So that's absolutely everything about variables, and we'll be using them all the time throughout the rest of the series, so don't worry, you'll get very used to them in no time. Let's start with a hypothetical scenario. Here I have a CSV file, and inside it, I have a list of 100 students at a hypothetical school all of which have maths and English scores. Okay, fair enough. However, there's something we need to do. We need to find the average English mark and the average maths mark from this file. Well, we can do that actually very easily with PowerShell. Let me show you how. I would like to introduce to you a very cool command in PowerShell called import CSV. What this does, is it takes in a CSV file and it turns all the info in there into objects. So we'll get 100 objects, each with a name property, an age property, a maths property, and an English property. Just like that. One command and it's all loaded in. If you're wondering about other formats, there's also an equivalent command for XML and JSON. Really, no matter what format you have, you can probably load it into PowerShell. So let's run get help on import CSV, so we can find out a little bit about how we use it. And you'll see here that, quite simply, we give it a path to a file. That's all we need. So let's do that. We'll run import CSV, and we'll set the path to our file. Super simple. And we're going to take what this gives us and put it into a variable called students. Just so we can work with those objects easily later on. And if we run it, it's done. Let's take a look at what's in the variable. And there they are. We have 100 objects with all the properties as you'd expect. And just like that, we can now immediately get straight to work finding the average. But first, there's just one thing we have to do. Now, unfortunately, there is a fundamental flaw when it comes to just CSV files in general. And that is, CSV files have no way of distinguishing between text and numbers. And what I mean by that is, when something is reading a CSV file, CSV gives it absolutely no way of knowing whether we want a property to be treated as text or something else. You see, to a computer, there's a difference between the number 12 and the literal text 1 and 2. One of them is a number we can do maths on, and the other one is just letters and symbols. In CSV, there's no way of knowing what is or isn't text, and what that means is anything that reads CSV will see all the properties as text. This isn't a problem with other formats like XML or JSON, because those actually have a way to distinguish between those things, but CSV doesn't, so every property is seen as text, as literal symbols. PowerShell is no exception, and with all of these properties we see here, their values are actually text. Now, most of the time, that may not even be a problem for us, but if we're gonna do some maths on these numbers, which we will be if we're finding the average, we're going to need to turn them into numbers first. Now, turning text into numbers in PowerShell is really easy. Let's say I have a variable called t, 
and I put the text 123 in here. Notice the quotes, meaning I'm putting text in it. Now, quite simply, if we want to turn what's in the variable into a number, we write out the variable, just as if we're getting it, but then before it, we write square brackets int. Int is short for integer, which means whole number. And what this will do is this will give us a number. We're literally taking what's in the variable and then turning it or converting it, if you will, into a number for us to do something with. So if I hit enter, there's the number it just converted. Now, if we want to set t to the new number, I'll just do this. So I take what was in t, which was this 1, 2, 3 text, and then I turn that 1, 2, 3 into a number, and then I put that new number back into the variable. So the variable has now changed from being text to being a number. This same concept actually applies to basically every programming language in existence. Yet yeah, you are basically learning stuff that applies to full-on programming languages in this series. Alright, so let's do this, but on our students. Now, we need to turn the maths and English into numbers. And it's actually quite easy to do that. So, we're going to take the students, and for each one, for each one of these rows, we're going to change their maths to be maths, but turned into an integer. So, for each student, one by one, we take their maths, turn it into a number, and then put that back into the variable. And we shall do the same for English as well. Great, so they're both numbers now. And now, to get the average maths time, all we do is, as usual, we use for each to filter it down to just the maths property, and then we'll use measure dash average to get the average. There you go, just like that, we have our average, and we can do the same for English too. So just like that, we were able to not only load an entire CSV file with literally one command, but it also all got automatically loaded into brand new fresh objects with all the correct properties on them. And we immediately got right down to doing the number crunching. Just like that. And I know some bits of that felt a little long, but honestly, the level of flexibility here is limitless. We could have been doing anything with that data. What if maybe it was a list of machines, and we want to go to each machine listed in the file and do something to them? Who knows, it really could be used for anything. But despite this, this still isn't really all that cool. How about we take this even further? Just before we do though, I do just want to talk a little bit about properties. Now, if you'll recall from episode 1, I said that every object is made up of property. And I said that that was it, there's nothing else. Yeah, I sort of lied. You see, properties aren't actually the only thing you can get inside an object. There are other things you can get too. And most of these other things just don't matter. In fact, most of them are actually really straightforward and obvious things. Like a script property, which is a property that runs a little script whenever you try to get or change what it is. So, just a property there for convenience. And there's a lot of other fairly obvious things like that I won't go into. However, there's one thing I do want to talk about, and that is a note property. There's an important detail about properties, okay? When we have an object, say an object that represents a process, and let's say it has three properties in it. Well, those three properties there are set in stone. Those three properties are actually stored physically in the code of .NET. So every different kind of object you can get, whether it's a process object or a file object, all of the properties you see on those are made physically right there, right inside the actual physical code of .NET. They're there before we even start up PowerShell. Now what this means is we can't change them. I can't just decide, you know what, I don't want this object to have this property anymore. No, you can't do that. Those properties have been chosen upon already in advance in the physical code and that's it. Those properties are there for good. And likewise, I also can't decide right in the middle of running PowerShell that actually, you know what, I'm just going to add a property to an object. No, you can't do that either. We can't just magic a property up out of thin air. However, enter a special kind of thing you can get in an object called a note property. This is a special thing that PowerShell provides that we can make while we're using PowerShell. 
we can add a note property to any object at any time whenever we want. And that's the difference. Regular properties have already been decided in advance. Note properties are properties we came up with while PowerShell is running. And you can just add these to any object you want. And we can use these for so many things because they let us attach absolutely any extra information we want to something. In fact, you know the objects import CSV gave us? Well, all of the properties on those objects are actually note properties because import CSV only finds out what properties it's going to need until it goes to read the CSV file, which obviously happens while PowerShell is running. And so, every property in all the objects it gives us are note properties. Anyway, why am I telling you this? Well, we're going to use this for our new, even more interesting job. We've got the average of all these marks, but now, we want to actually make a change to the CSV file. What we want to do is add a brand new sum column with the sum of every student's English and math scores. And the way we're going to do this is very simple. We're going to load in the CSV file, as we've already done, and then we're going to take all of the objects from that, and we're going to actually add our own sum property to every single one. So every object now has a sum on it. Then all we do is fill in all of those sum properties. And finally, in one single command called export CSV, we save all of those objects with all of those properties back into the CSV again. So let's take a look at this. First, let's get familiar with how exactly we add properties to objects. Here, in this variable, I have a very simple file object. It's just one object, and all I did to get it is just run ls, and then use where to filter it down to just this one file. And now, what I want to do is add my own property to this object. Just one other little column along here. I'm going to call this property importance, and we're going to use it to, let's say, hypothetically rank how important the file is. It's just for demonstration purposes, alright? So, to do this, we're going to use one of the last commands I'm going to tell you about, and it's called add member. It lets us add a member, add a smaller part to an object. And here's what we'll do. First, we're going to tell it exactly what object I want to add the property to. So, the input object will be my file here because I want to add the property to this file object. Next, we need to tell it exactly what kind of member I want to access, the member type. So, in our case, we want it to be a note property, and you'll notice that tab very kindly fills that in for us. And now comes the interesting part. Now, we give the name. I want to call it the importance, and you'll notice that since the name is text, I'm going to put it in quotes. Again, technically I can go without them, because PowerShell does let you do text without quotes, if it only has one word. But I like to be very clear that this is absolutely definitely text that we're dealing with. And finally, we're going to tell it what we want the property to start off as, using value. We'll just make it start off as zero. That's it, just the number zero. Done. Unfortunately, PowerShell has decided that our property isn't actually important enough to show us in the table. How funny. But, that's fine. We'll just specifically tell Format Table that we want it to show us this property too. All we do is use the property parameter, just to tell the table exactly which properties we want it to show us. And let's say that we want to see the name, the length, and most importantly, the importance we made. And there it is. We just made a property. Sure, in this particular case, we did have to poke format table a little to show us because it didn't think it was worth showing, but we still made a property regardless. And we can see that our importance is indeed zero. So how do we change this? Well, we take our file object, we reach into the deeper importance property inside it, and set it to five. Done. All right, so to sum all this up, we have note properties, which we can just sort of add as we want, unlike regular set in stone properties. We can make them with add member. We give it the object, tell it we want a note property, and then tell it what we want to call the property and what we want to put in it. And finally, once we have the property, we can change it just by writing our variable, followed by a dot, and what we want to change it to. That's it. That's all there is to it. Now, let's take all of this and apply it. So as you'll remember, these here are all of our objects from our CSV file. And what I want to do is 
add a sum property to every single one of these objects. And to do that, we'll use a for each. We're going to take all of our objects, and in a for each, we're going to run add member to add a sum property to each one. So the input object will be dollars underscore. We want to add the property to the object we're currently on each time. Then, of course, we want to have a note property. Not any of the other stuff you can get. And now, what's it called? Well, sum. And now we need to say what we want in them. There are two things you could do. You could just say, you know what, I'm going to leave them all to zero. And then do a second for each that goes through each object and sets the sum to the correct thing. But there's not really much point in that because we can choose what they'll be right here. So let's do that. Now, what we want this property to contain is the maths of the current object plus the English of the current object, right? That's how we'll work out what our sum will be. So, how do we add two numbers? Let's just take a step back and imagine here that I have a variable called single student that contains just one student. That's three years old, apparently. How exactly do I add the maths and English scores together? Well, it's actually really easy. Literally, all we do is we take the maths, so we'll take the variable and access the maths inside it, and then we'll add that to the English. So we'll get the English property inside the variable. And again, since we didn't put the result anywhere, PowerShell has just printed this out. So we're going to do exactly that here. Except we'll be doing dollars underscore, because we want to add the maths of our current object to the English of our current object. Now, unfortunately, there is just one minor problem with this. When PowerShell sees this command, what it's actually seeing is run add member, and then take what that gives us and add the English to it. That doesn't make any sense. So what we need to do is just make it clear that I want it to do this plus thing in one go. And I'll talk more about this in the next video, don't worry. To do that, we'll put it into brackets. These brackets are basically saying, do this plus thing in one go first, and then use the result of that right here. So, I'll do that. And now, if we look at what's in our variable, there they all are. All of the sums have been filled in, and if I want to save it to a CSV file, I'll take my students and pipe it into export CSV, and we'll give it the file name. And just like that, if we take a look at our new CSV file, we have new items. Now, I know one thing that's been on your mind throughout this entire video. Even if you don't think you were thinking it, you were probably thinking it. And that is, wow, that was certainly a lot of effort. But actually, it wasn't really. It feels a little slow at first because you're still getting used to it. That's how it goes with everything. But this system is so flexible. The things you could do with what was in that CSV file is endless. As I mentioned earlier, you could be sending things to machines, you could be sending commands to machines, getting results back. You could be doing all kinds of pretty incredible things that you just couldn't do in another command line. At least, not without a lot of pain. Okay, so we're at the end of the video now, but just one thing. I know also, these commands are really long, I mean... Seriously, look at this. What is this? Is there not a shorter way to do this? Well, actually, yeah, there is. There are actually quite a few simple aliases we can use to help shorten this down. And I will tell you about those in the next video. Bye.